Okay, uh, so today, guys, I want to talk to you about three things that can come out at, out of a dialogue. Uh, obviously, we know that name of the game in real estate is always going to be listings, right? Listings, listings, listings. That's the way you're going to leverage your business. I know a lot of people who make good money working with buyers, uh, but they get burned out. And I mean, they literally have like a nonstop 24 seven. They look, they look like somebody wound them up and then they're just going like a hundred miles an hour, but you could really leverage a, a full, full blown team business, everything, and still have a life when you work with a lot of listings. So what I want to teach you guys today, or what I want to cover today is the fact that when we have conversations with sellers, there is going to be three things that can either come out of it, right? We're going to get you an objection, a stall, or it's going to be a, a it's going to be a, um, a disagreement on price. In our case, it's going to be a disagreement on either price of the house or commission. We'll stick to commission, you know, or either one. It doesn't really matter. So those are the only three things that could deter you from getting a listing for a property. Am I correct? Is there anything else? It's usually an objection, which we got to learn how to handle. Either it's going to be that or it's going to be a stall, which is I got to talk to my wife, kind of get back to you. It's a stall. Or it's going to be I don't agree with the price on the house or I don't agree with your commission. Would you accept 3%? You know, like those are going to be different, three different things we're going to get from uh, a conversation. So what I want to focus on today is I want to be able to have you guys isolate that when it happens. I want you guys to be like, oh, wait, we spoke about this. This is something we covered in one of our trainings. So that way you know how to deal with it. You see, what happens a lot of times is that we're, we're in a conversation with a prospect, we kind of just are reactive instead of playing, you know, the proactive game or being like a chess player. We're playing checkers with our, our client. We're reacting to what they're saying. And then we're just going with the flow. That is not the sign of a good salesperson. That is a sign of someone who is just taking an order. Or if it falls in my lap, I'll take it. You're not using your skills. So the reason why you guys are jumping on these calls every Monday morning is because you want to get better. You don't want to be able to just continue doing as you've always done. You want to improve on yourself. Let me give you guys a quick example. Um, I've been looking for office space. I've been thinking about getting office space. And I went to go see a, um, a shared workspace recently. And um, when I went to go look at it, the place was gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful place. But to be honest with you, when I uh, when she told me the price, I was like, oh, my God, it's, that's a lot. But I didn't make it seem like, you know, like I felt that way. But I just thought to myself, wow, that's a lot more than what I thought it would be. You know, it was it was kind of marketed differently. So then um, as we're walking through the the, the I guess they call it the, the location, uh, we're ending our meeting. And um, I said, OK, well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll be in touch. And uh, so her on her end, you know, I, I kind of felt like she she had a lot of work to do. She said, OK, OK, if you have any questions, here's my card. Please give me a call. And I thought to myself, like, you know what? If she would have been a little bit more kind of like a proactive, she kind she could have quartered me into a position where I would have given her my real feelings about it. Instead, I just kind of skated around and told her, "Okay, I'll let you know. You know, I'll, I'm gonna I'll get back to you or whatever, whatever I said to her." What she should have said to me was, "So, what did you think?" She could have also said, "Is that the price range you had in mind?" So, which office did you like best? Out of all the things that you saw here today, what excited you the most, like Micah likes to say, but she didn't ask me any of those things. So I felt like, you know what, this is a lot of, this is a lot of agents. A lot of agents are like this. They're being more reactive than they're being proactive. So I basically gave her a stall. You know, I gave her a stall, said, you know, I'll get back to you. I gotta, I gotta think about it. And, and I left and I thought to myself, two things. I thought to myself, wow, that was expensive. <laughs> that was a lot. <laughs> And the other thing I thought to myself, I was like, she could have done a lot better job of trying to uh, to sell me, even though I still probably would have said, who knows, maybe she would have been really good, like Grant Cardone or something. Maybe I would have probably said, yeah, you know, she would have sold me on the benefits on why it's worth, you know, the amount of money they're charging. Maybe I would have changed my mind. You know, maybe if she would have said, look, you know, if um, if you if, if you were able to work out a deal, maybe you can get the first three months free or something, you know, like whatever, you know, sweeten the deal to the point where you can't say no. Why do you think people say yes to anything? Why do you think people buy? Why do you, why do you buy anything? Uh, let me see if I can, if I can have, pick you for a, for a second, Alejandro. 
Alejandro, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself, why do you buy anything? Why, why did you, what was one of the last things that you bought that you could think of? Uh, we can't hear you, buddy. You're still on mute. Oh, because I found value. It's, uh, it seems to be valuable to me. What's one of the last things you bought? The last thing I bought, well, I went to the supermarket. It's valuable because uh, I need to eat. Yeah, you need to eat, right? If you don't eat, you're, you're going to die. So obviously your life is valuable. So uh, okay. yeah, I mean, that we can use that as an example. So what Alejandro is saying is that if you find enough value in anything, you're going to buy. So to us as, as human beings, there's nothing more valuable than food and shelter, right? Food and shelter, no matter what, food and shelter. And, uh, you know, whatever, we could, we could make an argument about how much we should spend on food, whether we should go to Whole Foods or whether we should go to the corner bodega or maybe we should go to Aldi, or maybe we should live in a, in a mansion, or we could just live in a one-bedroom apartment. Now, that, that's up to you. That's your personal decision. But what, I'm, what I want to get across, the point I'm trying to make across to you guys, is that we as human beings, we don't buy unless we find perceived value. So Alejandro might say, you know what? To me, I find that there's enough value in going to shop at ShopRite for me to be able to constitute spending that much money. Somebody else might say, shop right, what are you crazy? Like I only shop at Costco and Aldi because it's too expensive to go shop at shop right. You know, someone might think that that's not valuable enough, but then we may have someone else who says, you know what? I would only shop at Wegmans and I would only shop at Whole Foods. And I only get my meat from the one butcher in Scotch Plains who has the best meat in the entire state. Why? Because they find enough perceived value in that. So it, it doesn't really, everyone's going to find different value and different things at different price levels. But if somebody is within the price range or somebody's within like the proximity of it, there could be an argument made where I can convince Alejandro, like Alejandro, what did you buy at ShopRite? Oh, you bought, you bought, okay, you bought, you bought produce, which is, uh, you bought fruit, you bought, okay, you bought vegetables. Oh, Alejandro, did you know that for only 10 cents more a pound, you can get organic bananas at Whole Foods. And did you know that bananas get sprayed with all types of chemicals that could possibly give you a, a medical issues in the future? Did you know about that? Alejandro might be like, wow, you know what? I, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that, you know, for only 10 cents more, I could get that. Now, what I'm doing there is I'm adding enough value for Alejandro to now understand that, wow, maybe I've been making the wrong decision this whole time. So, you know, that's exactly what I'm trying to get at you guys today. I'm trying to explain to you is that when we're talking to someone and we're in each other's presence, there's proximity, which means that people would rather buy convenience than buy price. Don't you guys think that's true? Would you, would you say that people would rather, rather buy ease and comfort and they would rather buy convenience than they would rather buy price. Do you guys know what I mean by that? Yeah, that makes sense, man. Makes yeah. sense, right? How much do you guys pay for popcorn at the movie theater? $10 a bucket, right? What does it cost? It probably costs like 10 cents to make. <laughs> we buy that because we have convenience and we're probably not allowed to walk in with our own bucket of popcorn. But let's just say we're at the beach and we forgot our sunscreen. And we know the sunscreen costs five bucks at, at Walgreens but someone's walking around selling sunscreen for $20 a bottle and we're burning up under the sun. Are we going to buy that? We're going to buy it because it's out of convenience. If we are buying something from Amazon and we need it for this weekend because we're going somewhere and you're going to pay 10 extra bucks to get it by the weekend, or you're just going to get it whenever it gets here, we're going to pay the extra money because we're paying for convenience. I'm sorry, guys. I, I just realized I didn't have my, I didn't have my camera on this whole time. My apologies. My apologies about that, guys. Yeah, so what I mean is that when we're talking to someone, we can give enough perceived value and we can give enough for the other person, the other party, the other individual to say, you know what, that's an offer that I cannot refuse. That's something that like, oh my God, it's really, you're, you've stacked so much value there that I'd be, a, I'd be a fool to say no, right? But how do we know that we're adding value how do we know that, guys? How do we know if we're adding value? How did I know that? How did I know that that Alejandro um, went to go and buy produce? How did I know that?
anyone. You just take a stab at it. There's no uh, right or wrong answer. I, I missed the first part. I missed the first part of it, ma'am. I would oh, say you probably okay. listened to you probably had a conversation. You listen, you actually listened to what he said and addressed those needs. Yeah, Is yeah. That- or I, I could simply just ask the right questions. The way of having a better conversation, guys, is to learn how to ask better questions. Better questions will get you better answers. Does that make sense? Right? So, Alejandro, um, are you able to talk, buddy? Or are you going, you look like you're probably going somewhere. Yeah, I can talk. Okay, okay. So, where did you go food shopping the other day? I went to uh, Ciabras. You went to Ciabras, okay. Um, why did you go to Ciabras, buddy? Can I ask you that? Like, is it convenient for you? Is it by your house? Yes, yeah, close to my house, yes. Close to your house. Um, what, what do you like best about Ciabras? Is it like any certain kind of foods that you buy from there specifically? Not really. It's close to my house. It's just convenient. It's right? Okay, so let me take a time out for a second. That's exactly what I want to explain to you guys today. One of the things is that um, he, um, he made that decision out of convenience. You see that, right? Convenience. Now, it'll be tough for me to get Alejandro to go somewhere else. It's going to be difficult because if Alejandro was traveling to go further and I can convince him to go somewhere uh, closer, it'd probably be an easier sell. I would literally have to tell Alejandro something about Ciabras that would turn him off so much and maybe have him not want to go there in order for him to even consider going to, let's say, I don't know, maybe um, shop right, you know, maybe uh, five miles down the road more. So if I if I were to tell Alejandro, look, Alejandro, I know you like going there, right? What, what do you really, what do you think you're saving by going? Are you just saving time? You think you're saving yourself maybe 15 minute drive? Is that your biggest, is that your biggest um, savings from going there? Yes, it could be. Yeah, okay. just a drive. I get you. Did, did you know that if you buy the same things every week, is that correct? Do you buy mostly the same milk, cheese, fruits, vegetables, all of that? Um, yeah, usually, okay. uh, usually about the same. Okay. Alejandro, what if I told you that I can help you set up your shopping list so Amazon can drop that food off to your house every single week at the same time without you having to go anywhere? And you will save yourself not only the trip to, to Ciabras, but you'll save yourself an hour shopping there as well every week. Would that hour back into your life be valuable to you? Sure, I will. What if I told you that the price was almost the same? That sounds, sounds good to me. Sounds good the to you. Thing, the only thing is I don't like people uh, touching my my food, um, especially the, the stories I heard in Amazon, who, people who work there. Okay. Um, do you think that people touch your food at Ciabras before you get there? Yes, uh, but it's more, uh, how can I say? Well, uh, I didn't hear his stories about Ciabras, but I heard stories about Amazon. So. Okay. Ha, ha, do you know anyone personally that has gotten sick because of that? Not really, but I, I heard, you know, workers from there dropping stuff and, and they just say white people order food <laughs> in Amazon. It's, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Alejandro, could, could I ask you a question about this? There's a saying that goes, you can only believe, don't believe, what you, don't believe everything you hear and only some of the things you see. Would you agree with that statement? Sure. So if you've never seen that with your own eyes, could you really say that that's true? Well, like I say, I know there's people who work in Amazon. They're actually friends of mine. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm skeptical of order, especially like a pie or anything that I can just write. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. What if I told you that Amazon had a money back guarantee that if something was delivered to your house that was tampered with or that looks like it's not up to uh, the standards that you're usually used to getting? That they will refund your your purchase for that. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure some of the policy. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Okay, so my question to you is, Alejandro, if I could save you an hour of your time, which is worth how much? Have you ever calculated how much an hour of your time is worth? Yeah, um, I haven't really calculated, but it it worth a lot. No, it worth uh, it worth a lot. Okay, so let's just say that your hour of your time is worth at least, at the very minimum, a hundred dollars. And you're paying the same amount for the food. You're not wasting any of your time, your gas money or anything like that going to the supermarket. And you've got a money back guarantee that if your food is tampered with, that you'll, you'll get reimbursed for everything you spent. Would you consider using Amazon services at least once? Uh, yeah, why not? Okay. Now, I understand your friend works there, but at the same time, 
there's a lot of people that work at Amazon who are good people. Do you think that's correct as well? Oh, sure, yeah. Or do you think that everybody at Amazon is a bad person? No, no, everybody, everybody is not a bad person. Yeah, so I agree with you. There's good people, there's bad people. There's bad seeds everywhere. I'm sure there's good and bad people at Ciabras. But I think if you gave the opportunity to check uh, Amazon services just at least once, you'll find enough value in it for you to understand why it might be worth your time. And I guarantee you, Alejandro, once you get convenience in your life, you're never going to want to go back. Absolutely, I agree. Okay. Good. So you see what I just did there is I just gave Alejandro so much. I asked him a lot of questions, a lot of questions. And Alejandro was doing a great job being objective. You know, he's got a friend there and everything. And that was great because we get that. We get that in real estate. We don't get underhanded pitches at 20 miles an hour. You know, we get a fastball that's coming right at the side of our head. And we, don't, we have to figure out how to deal with that. So Alejandro's objections were great. And at the same time, like, you got to keep a steady head, guys. And remember, just because he has a friend that works at Amazon who, who thinks that, who tells me that, you know what, I, I spit at every person's food who I deliver, you know, it doesn't mean that everyone is like that. And sooner or later, I mean, I believe in karma. I'm sure his friend's going to lose his job or he's going to quit because he sounds miserable to me. But that's not the point of this conversation. The point of the conversation is that I put enough doubt into his head about everyone being like that at Amazon. And I also asked him how much his time was worth. And I said, look, you're getting your time back. Isn't that valuable to you? And at the same time, you'll be able to, be, you'll be able to pay just as much as you're paying now with all the convenience and all of the uh, quality that you're used to. Do you guys follow me? Do you guys understand what I'm doing there? Yeah, that makes sense, man. Good, good, good. So yeah. what, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm adding value and I'm... Hold on, let me just uh, mute Alejandro for a second. All right. So what I'm doing there is I'm trying to add enough value into something so um, ordinary or mundane, you would call it, as uh, going food shopping. So now let's talk about buying a house or selling a house. We get stalls all the time, right? We get people say, I need to think about it. I need to talk to my wife. You know what? I'll get back to you. Thank you for the information, but we're just not ready yet. You know what? I got to check to see if I have an, you know, if I have the time, you know, like those types of things. Like we, these are all considered to be stalls. And we're, we're, the reason why people are stalling is because they don't think we're adding enough value to them yet. And if it, because if someone said to you, look, Tammy, here's a pair of Prada high heel, uh, high heel shoes. They're normally $500, but I'll give you these shoes for 50 bucks. You know, do you have to think about it? Do you have to come back and say, you know what? I don't know. I got to check with my husband. You know, like, no, of course you don't. You know, you're going to be like 50 bucks. Do you have any more? Like, I want to take a few pairs. It's amazing that you're saying this, Louis, because I went on a listing appointment last week. Yeah. And um, I felt like, I should have broke, I should have brought, did more of a seller's, uh, what do you call that? A seller's, uh, uh, you do it on RPR. Uh, CMA? Yeah, I should have did the full CMA, but I just went and looked at the house. Yes. And I felt like I should have did like a seller net sheet mm -hmm. so they can see how much they can net. And I think they would have pulled the trigger quicker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call them back because they interested, but they're not sure when they want to list. Yeah. But I'm going to call them back this week and see if I can come and do that for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. But yeah. I felt like if I would have did that, they would have been more excited to be like, okay, I'm ready like next week. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, any visual, any visual image you can add is amazing, especially when it's numbers, you know, that really, really does help. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed enough that, you know, a lot of times I deal with a lot of repetitive listing clients, but when you're dealing with a first time listing, you got to pull out everything. You got to pull out the kitchen sink. You got to show them everything you got. And um, you've got to ask a lot of questions. It's very intimidating guys. I get it. It's very intimidating when you don't know someone to go, Oh, am I being too pushy? Am I being too salesy? Uh, but no, I mean, look, you're there for a purpose. You're there for a reason. They didn't invite you in the house because they were just curious. They're going to be selling, you know, they're going to sell their house, whether that, whether that's with you, or with someone else, they're going to sell. And remember what Alejandro told me about going to Ciabras, it's close to his house. So that means that what I said earlier is that people would rather buy convenience over buying price. So what more convenience can they have than having an agent already in front of them? 
I can just get my problem over with right now. I can, I can literally just list with this agent right now and I could be done with it, right? Think about that, right? Instead of having to meet with two more agents, maybe talk to a different agent we had to show the house to again, right? So how do we wrap that up into a package and, and tell our, our clients or our prospective client, you know, listen, let's just wrap this up right now. Without we're not making it sound like they're lazy because that's what people are at the end of the day. They don't want to expend any more energy than they have to. How do we get that? How do we interpret that over to our client in a way where they understand like, look, I'm here, I'm with you right now. Let's just take care of this thing now and let's just move on with our lives, right? Now, I'm going to tell you guys a quick story. And I, I never in a million years thought that this would, would have worked. I went to a listing appointment with Harry. I don't know why he asked me to go on a listing appointment. I think he just wanted to show me how good he got, right? So I went to a listing appointment with Harry a couple of years ago. And we went to this house. And the lady was, you know, very nice lady. It seemed like they knew each other from like mutual friends or whatever. Uh, the husband was like super ready to sell the house, but the wife wasn't. She wasn't. She was still kind of like on the fence uh, and like thinking about should we should we fix this or we repair that before we go list it and like you know is the market you know good right now like all the things you could think of right but the husband was ready he was like man if we could sell this thing yesterday like I'm all in so when the time came that we're talking turkey and we're talking numbers about how much the house is worth how much it could sell for uh, the lady says okay well I need to think about it because I you know I want to uh, make some repairs. And I was like, oh man, you know, like I already knew from the door, like she was going to be like that. And I was going to try to maybe see if we can use the husband to kind of like, you know, put his two cents in. But before I even got a chance, Harry was like, you know what? I totally get that. I understand, but let's just do this. That way I don't have to come back here and bother you again. And we don't have to show, you know, show me the house once it's ready, because I'm sure you're going to do a beautiful job. Let's just get the paperwork signed right now, get it out of the way. And then when it's ready, you let me know. And then I'll, I'll, I'll put whatever date, you know, it's going to commence that. And then we'll get it done. Does that sound like a plan? I was like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that. Like, that's crazy. Why would she ever do that? She said, okay. She said, all right. And I was like, I, I was like, when I left there, I said, Harry, that was amazing, bro. That, that was, you've, you've, you've definitely exceeded anything that I could have ever taught you because I would have literally taken a different approach. But he literally just told the lady like, okay, I understand out of convenience sake, basically is what he said. Let me just get this paperwork out of the way with you now. So I don't have to come back and bother you guys another day. You don't have to worry about, you know, when the house is ready and then have one more thing to have me come over and check it again. I trust you're going to do a great job. Next time anyone's going to be in your house is going to be the photographer. And then we we'll get the house sold. You know, so that to me just shows- I love that. Yeah, it's true. It's convenience. Such convenience. I mean, guys, people, one of the things that I heard in, in sales is that the most abundant thing in the world is procrastination. You know, people procrastinate so much when they know what's good for them. Like there are people that are in this world who are 20 pounds overweight and they know all it takes for them to do is just make a decision to go to the gym and eat healthier. But why don't they do it? Because they're procrastinating. They're just their own worst enemy. Everyone, a lot of times you'll, you'll come to understand is that we're our own worst enemies when it comes to making decisions. I'm, I'm no exclusion. Everybody is. But when we understand that, we, we, we learn not to take things personally when it comes to sales. If someone tells you an objection, like, you know, your, your, you know, your ties aren't crooked, you know, <laughs> or, or, you know, uh, how many homes have you sold here? I want to sell with somebody that's a local agent. That's an objection, right? I got to think about it as a stall. I'll get back to you when the time is right. It's a stall. So first things first is that we know we got to learn how to identify which is an objection, which is a stall, and which one's price. So do you guys, because I had a hard time for a while differentiating a stall from an objection. I thought they were all the same, but it's not. A stall means like, I got to talk to my wife and I'll be ready later. So how do we counteract something like that? So today we're going to talk about some objection handlers. How do we handle objections such as um, an objection would be a uh, hard objection would be something like, you know what, you're not, I've never heard of your real estate company before. I only want to list my house with a, with a company that I know, you know, that's an, that's an objection. The stalls are stalls, stalls is I'm not ready yet. And then uh, obviously we have the, uh, the price issues with your commission is too high. So we're going to do an example of each one. So um, maybe we can get a volunteer for, for our first one, which is an objection. Anyone want to volunteer to see if you guys can sharpen your skills just a bit? 
I already picked on Alejandro, so I feel like, you know, he should. I'll volunteer. Oh, thank you, Tabby. Okay, Tabby. So you're an agent who's coming to my house to try to get the listing. And uh -huh. I'm going to tell you, um, and I'm going to use your real life scenario. So uh, Tabby, <laughs> okay. you're, coming, you're coming to Monmouth County, right? You're in Monmouth County. You're looking at Yep. So Tabitha, um, you know, thank you for coming to look at my house. And, uh, you know, I really, I really love your story about you know, coming here from New York and all of that. But at the same time, that's my main concern is that you're not from this area. And I feel like you may not be the right agent to sell my house. Now, well, you know, I thank you so much for sharing that with me. And I could definitely understand your, con con you know, your thoughts on that. Um, it makes sense, right? But I want to be the first to let you know that my brokerage, EXP Realty, not only is very familiar with the area, but we have years upon years of experience in Monmouth County. Um, not only that, but I have a slew of agents that I can call on with any extreme you know, concerns that you may have or, or any needs at all. But more than that, being that I'm new to the area, I have to tell you that I've fallen in love with it. So basically, even though you don't know me very well, I can tell you this, you will trust me because I'm always gonna put your best interests at heart, number one, and make sure that you're getting exactly what you want and need and that I'm listening to your concerns. Very good, very good, I like that. So Tabby, did I hit you with an objection, a stall, or was it overpriced? Um, I think I cheated a little bit because you said objection for this kind of thing earlier. So I wanna say objection, but I would have saw that as a stall to be honest. You would have saw it as a stall because why? Because, because I'm, I'm telling you, I don't want to work with you. I'm not telling you maybe later. I'm telling, I personally said, I don't think I, I, you're the right agent. So you consider that a stall? I think because the person said it nicely, I wouldn't, like for me, an objection is kind of hardcore. <laughs> Again, because I worked in collections. So you have yeah. to be like, not interested. <laughs> like that's why you have to say it for me. Otherwise, I feel like everything with the right words and with learning from you guys, then I can kind of overcome, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Look, I was in the same boat as you. I thought that objections were like hard stops and, you know, stalls were like soft, you know, maybe more soft. And that's actually not true. An mm -hmm. objection is, is basically saying no. A stall is saying a maybe. Okay. So think, okay. of a, think, think of a stall as, uh, think of an objection as a no and a stall as a maybe. Okay. Okay. That's more or less what it would be, or, or maybe not right now. That's really what, what it is. So you did a great job. You did a good job handling that. I like that. I'm gonna give. You, I'm gonna give you. Um, I mean, I'm gonna give you some advice on it, obviously. But I want okay. the, the agents to kind of uh, chime in first before I go and say anything. What did you guys think? How did Tabby do uh, handling my objection about her being from another state and not being a local Monmouth County agent? I thought she did very well. I thought she did well too. Her tone was great. Mm -hmm. what else? And I like the fact that even though she's was new to the area she said she's fallen in love with the area mm -hmm. and that she was willing to do what was necessary to meet the needs of the client yeah of course all right um one thing i'm going to tell you in in my my perspective what i could what you should have done just a little bit differently there is mm -hmm. uh, ask a little more questions so for instance tabby you're the seller i'm, I'm tabby now okay yes okay, mr seller why do you feel that a local agent should be the one that's going to sell your house can i ask you that question Yes. Sorry, I think I'm getting confused. What am I supposed to do right now? You're the, you're the seller. We'll switch roles real quick, okay? So, okay, well, I totally understand your concern, Mr. Seller. Okay. Uh, but let me ask you a question. Why is it that you think that a local agent is more qualified to sell your house? Well, you know, I know lots of, for example, I have a friend, you know, they, they have a son and he's born and raised here. He went to high school with my kids. So I know the kid knows the area at like the back of his hand. So I feel like if I were to go to him, he'd be a lot more knowledgeable uh, about everything pretty much. Okay. So basically what you're telling me is that you want an agent who knows the area, but what about an agent who has the clients? Oh, okay. I didn't think about it that way. Okay. Do you know where the majority of buyers are coming from right now, Mr. Seller? Uh, I mean, I, I guess you're going to tell me. <laughs> do you think they're coming from Tommy's Pizzeria or do you think they're coming from New York? Maybe, yeah, from New York. I guess I could, that could definitely happen. Okay, well, you know, my sphere of influence is from New York. It's not from Tommy's Pizza. And I appreciate that your friend, you know, sold their house with someone who knows the ins and outs of the area. But what I'm here to tell you is that if you want someone who's going to attract buyers and they're going to be willing to pay the highest price right now, 
they're most likely going to be coming from out of state. And who knows an out-of-state buyer better than an agent who is from out of state and who has those relationships already? Oh wow, that's that's amazing. Yeah, I mean that's gonna help me so much. Thanks, Louis. What a tool, what a tool, because I am scared, you know, intimidated and, and a little lost, but um yeah, that's a great, that's great advice. When when you are handling an objection, guys, the only thing you're supposed to do is ask questions and make restatements and then close. Because what happens? Are we supposed to convince people? No, we're not. We're supposed to ask the questions and make restatements until the people convince themselves. Because when I told you, do you want someone who knows the area or do you want someone who has the clients? So basically what you're telling me is you want somebody who knows, because what I'm gonna do is turn it into a restatement. So what I'm hearing or what you're saying, because now I'm letting them know that I'm paying attention, is that you would rather have an agent that knows the area rather than an agent who has the clients? Is that correct? Well, no, well, no, that's not exactly what I'm saying. So, you know, they're contradicting themselves now. And then you say, well, would it be correct to say that you want an agent who is going to be able to bring you the best qualified clients? Yes, that's, that's what I would want. Okay. Well, do you know where the demographics of the buyers are coming from at this moment in time, where the best clients are coming from? No, actually, I don't. Uh, but I heard that a lot of them coming from New York. Oh, well, you know what? You're in luck because I'm from New York. And I do know the psychology of a buyer from New York. And I do know a lot of people from New York who are actually thinking about migrating to this area. And I also have a good sphere of influence with real estate agents in New York where I could put a word out and see if anyone is interested in coming down to Monmouth County. And I don't think a local agent has those kinds of avenues. So you just leave it like that. And then you give them enough to think about. You're giving such... You're giving them such great restatements and um, you, you know, you're coming back to their objections with such great points that they're going to end up selling themselves on it. And then at the end, what happens is you got to add so much value at the end that they close themselves. So Mr. and Mr. Seller or Mr. and Mrs. Seller, not only do I feel like I'm the most qualified agent to sell your house, but I'm also the most well versed in real estate because not only do I have two years in selling real estate full time, but I have the backing of a real estate company that has over 1000 real estate agents in New Jersey. How many agents do you think your local agent has? Well, our network is a lot bigger. And not only that, but I can also be very aggressive when it comes to marketing your home. And I can also be very aggressive when it comes to giving you a competitive commission structure. Because you did mention that commission was important to you. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. What do you think a fair commission amount is? 4%. Okay. 4%. I normally do 5% with my clients. And I'll tell you why. This is why I give 5%. Because first of all, we should never give a buyer's agent less than 2.5 commission. Because a buyer's agent will most likely not want to show your house if it's giving them less commission than the house down the road. Do you think that that would be accurate to say? If you were looking for a job, would you go to the one that's paying you on par with what you feel your time and energy is worth? Or would you go to a job where you're going to get paid less? You know, you're asking rhetorical questions. Of course, I'd want to go with the one that's paying me more. Good. So we've established that we should pay out no less than 2.5% commission to a buyer's agent. Okay, good. Now, do you think, in your opinion, that I'm going to do any less work than the buyer's agent? No, you don't. Or you, oh, or maybe, myself on you. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe <laughs> no. you don't say, yeah, you know what? Yes. All you do is, all, all you guys do is just come here and put a sign up. You know, give me an answer. Do you think I'm going to do any less work than the buyer's agent? I mean, you're saying aggressive marketing plan. I don't know what all that covers, but I would assume that you would be doing that, not the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Is getting the most amount of money for your home the most important thing for you? Definitely. Okay. If I can show you that in my track history and my company's track history, we've not only been selling homes for full price, but we've been selling homes for over asking. Would you be willing to then pay me 1% commission more if I can promise you 5% more on your, on your home if you market it the way, I, the, the way that I have envisioned? Is that something that you would consider? I mean, it sounds a little risky, but um, if you if you show me what you're talking about, uh, yeah, I guess okay. we could work that out. 
Well, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I think the only thing risky would be going with a discount brokerage because when you are going to take an agent who's so willing to cut their commission with just meeting you, what do you think that means about how they handle their business? Do you think that that's someone who really values what they do, who has, who has steps, who has people in, in the background who help them? Or do you think that you're probably just hiring a one-person show who is just going to basically list your home, put a sign up, and walk away? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's a good assumption. I, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. So the way I work is very different than other real estate agents. I'm actually running a real business here. You know, we have accountability. We have structure. We have personnel. And we do this in order to provide a better experience for our clients. And I'm sure that risking 1% more in commission is not really a risk because at the end of the day, you don't pay us a dime until we show you results. And this is the only business in the world where we have to work first before we get paid. And if we don't work in the capacity that you feel is worth 5%, guess what? You can fire me at any time. Oh, okay. No, I didn't think about that either. Uh, that's a good point about that you're working before you get paid. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so you're asking me to basically take a pay cut before I even show you what I'm made of. <laughs> uh, you don't have to put it like that now. <laughs> Yeah, so you know what? It may seem like you know I'm I'm being a little bit uh, a, a little bit maybe uh, aggressive, but uh, guys, at times, like I told you, we're we're what we're doing here is we're trying to get the person off the fence. You know, we don't want to go there for pleasantries. We're not going there to compliment them on their kitchen, you know, countertops. You know, we're there to to make sure that they make a decision, and hopefully that decision is made with us. So, all right, that's an that's an example of an objection. Now let's take exam. Let's let's do an example of a stall. A stall, okay. So, Tammy, do you want to try a stall with me? Sure. Okay, so Tammy, you're going to be the homeowner, and I'm going to tell you that um, I have to talk to my wife, okay? Um, okay, so, Tammy, thank you for coming over, and, uh, you know, you sound like a very pleasant person, and, you know, I'd love to work with you, but, you know, everything that you're saying does make sense to me, but I still have to talk it over with my wife. Is there a way I can, you know, possibly give you a call, you know, later on this week? You're muted, sweetheart. I'm sorry. You the homeowner? You're the homeowner. Um, you're the agent, and I'm the homeowner. So thank you, Tammy, for coming over. I appreciate everything you said today. It makes a lot of sense, and we like, you know, I, I like you. I think you're a good girl. Uh, I'll get back to you at the end of this week. I got to talk to my wife first. Okay, great. I truly understand that because I never make a decision without my husband. But um, um, I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. The first thing you always want to do, cushion. If you're, it's an uncomfortable question, first you cushion, then you ask questions. Cushion is the question. Okay. Okay. So yes, I truly understand that because I don't like to make decisions without talking to my husband. Mm -hmm. But um, what, what is your, what is your wife's motivation on um, selling your home? Did you guys discuss it? Yeah, well, her and I both think that it's about time that we uh, upgrade the house a little bit and we need a little more space and a little more yard. We're thinking about, you know, maybe having kids in the future. So that would be uh, definitely something that we want to aim towards getting a bigger house. Oh, OK, great. So um, if, if you guys did decide to move, where would you guys looking to go in state, out of state? Uh, we're thinking uh, we're thinking about staying within the city. We just want to move to more of the outskirts where we can get a little more land. Oh, okay, that's that's great. You guys want to stay in the school, same school system. So yeah. when do you think you'll have time to discuss it with your wife? Um, more than likely, let's see, today is Monday. I'm thinking her and I have a busy schedule. Probably have first opportunity is by Wednesday, we'll be able to talk. Wednesday? Mm -hmm. So would it make sense for me to come back Wednesday with you and your wife so I can talk to both you guys? Mm, sure, I don't see why I'm not. Come back a CMA to let you know what you guys can um, expect in this market. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, we could do that. Okay, so Wednesday around five p.m. is that is that good? Um, you know what? Why don't you just let me get back to you? I'll give her a call and uh, I'll give you a call later on today. I'll let you know if that works. Okay, because I'll definitely be in the area on Wednesday, so. Um, do you know when you're going to talk to your wife? You're going to talk to her today? Yeah, I'll talk to her today uh, once she gets home from work. 
Okay, because my schedule get pretty filled up quickly, so mm -hmm. I will be in that area. So it would, um, I would like to make the appointment ahead of time so I won't get booked up. Okay, no problem. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely let you know then by the end of today. All right, sounds good. Mm -hmm. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, you, you, um, obviously, you did, you did a lot better than what you probably thought you were going to do. So I'll let the agents give you a couple of uh, pointers first before I, I point out anything I saw. Anyone want to give uh, Tammy any insight on in what they heard here? Uh, your tone was excellent. Very, very good. That's the Tammy we know. <laughs> yeah, your tone was much better. <laughs> yeah, I think she did good too, but I think that um, maybe if she had um, kind of pinpointed him a little bit as to the telephone number and her giving him a call back um, prior to maybe pinpointing uh, uh, try to corner her not corner her but pinpointing a time and date that she, a definite date that she could come over mm -hmm. would have been helpful yeah of course anyone else <laughs> yeah, if i did a good job asking questions to him I, I was at the same thing as far as just point improvement just say when he's saying oh yeah i'll talk to her i'll talk to her but just say hey i would say something probably hey we'll just make it really easy for you how about i give you a call back around 6 30 would that be good and he's like, oh, yeah, no, well, how about seven? Okay, no worries. Mm -hmm. That way, sort of, he's making the decision, but he's sort of planted that So I'll, I'll like the, the rest of it, I liked it. Okay. Yeah, you did, you did a good job, Tammy. The, um, obviously, you probably weren't expecting two, two stalls in one conversation because I gave you a stall about the appointment. And I'm sorry, I gave you a stall about listing with you, and then I gave you a stall about you coming back to the house. So I gave you two in one. So you did really good with the first one because you told me that you would um, come back. And I said, that sounded like a good idea. And then you um, then I think asked me about what time or something. And I told you I'd get back to you. I'll talk to my wife. And, you know, you, you kind of that one you didn't handle as well. I, I feel like you could have handled that one a little bit better. So, for instance, let's let's do more questioning when we're, we're getting stalls. Maybe let's do some questioning. Right. So, for instance. Uh, you're going to be the seller for just one second. So you're the seller and I'm Tammy and you're telling me that, hey, listen, I got to talk to my wife and see if that works, right? Because I already gave you a stall saying, you know what, um, that sounds good. You're great. You know, I got to talk to my wife about everything you said and uh, I'll get back to you. You know, when are you going to talk to her? Well, I'll probably end up talking to her by Wednesday. Okay. And you're like, oh, okay, well, I can be here on Wednesday. That was great. I like the fact that you said you could be here on Wednesday to talk to both of us. That was good. But then I told you that, look, I'll, I'll let you know about that. I'll confirm with her today. So that's where I kind of gave you that double stall. So what I could do, what I, what I, what you should do if you're in that situation, what we should all do is this. Okay, Mr. Seller, uh, does your wife know that you had an appointment scheduled with me today? Yes, she does, right? You, you can tell me yes or no, whatever, it doesn't mean. Yes. Mr. Yeah. Oh, she does, okay. So I'm sure she's probably very eager to find out how this conversation went, right? Because it's not every day that you're meeting with someone to talk about the biggest asset that both you and her own. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So why don't we do this? Let's give her a quick call right now on conference call. So we can just fill her in. So that way we don't keep her on ice till the end of the day or till Wednesday. Does that sound like a plan? Yes. Okay. Now you're going to tell me Oh, she's. Oh she's, no, no, she's at work. Wait, she's let me surgery right now. She's, yeah, she's too. Well, she's at work right now. Right? <laughs> Whatever, right? Oh, okay. So you're. What, so what you're saying is that her job doesn't allow her to pick up phone calls right now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, I I totally get that. I understand. When I'm with my clients, I don't accept calls either. I want to be 100 percent focused. So I I totally get it. What time does your wife normally get home on the evenings? About 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay, amazing. So this is what I'll do. 5 p.m. Uh, this afternoon, 5.15, I'll give her a few minutes to, to settle in. I'll give both of you a call. You put me on speakerphone, and I will convey the message once more to your wife and to you. And if you have any questions between now and then, I'll be more than glad to answer those. Does that sound like something a little bit better? That way I can save you the, the agony of trying to repeat everything I said, and you may not even remember anything by then. Yes, that sounds good. Okay. Now, by 5 p.m., I'll have my CMA ready, almost ready. It should be about 90% ready. It probably won't be 100% ready to the end of the week, but I'll have enough information in order to give you guys some more concrete numbers. On top of that, I'll also have some properties 
that are currently right now going under contract that could affect the price of your home once you do sell it. Does that sound good? Yes. All right, good. So I'll be giving you a call this afternoon around 515. I look forward to speaking to you and your wife, and then we'll set up a, a, an in-face appointment for later on. Sound good? Yes. All right, perfect. All right. So perfect. what I did there, yeah. yeah, what I did there is I asked you some questions, and then I also, and then what I also did was I gave you an, um, I gave you an offer that was too good to pass pass off because not only would I be able to do the work for you, I'll also have more information for you that's going to be very valuable. So. Um, that's one thing that I think we should all do is have too much value for them to pass up, for them to like cancel on us or not take our call. Because mm -hmm. one, one thing we got to remember is this. When someone doesn't want to buy or somebody doesn't want to sell, there's no talking or questions or anything in the world that's going to make them do that. right? But if they do want to do it, using these techniques are going to improve the rate at which you guys take listings. It definitely mm -hmm. is going to improve the rate. So all we need to do is just work on these little things and then we'll increase our percentage of closing. We can close the closable. We can't close the people who are not really serious. That we'll never be able to do. I, I have, have a question, right. Louis. Because okay. one time you, because what one um object, well, stall. Yeah. I don't know if it's a stall or it, objection I get is, okay, if I, um the, 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 price, the house prices are high now, but when it's time for me to buy, um they're high too yeah absolutely where i'm gonna live at so where i'm gonna go yeah that's that's more of an objection because it's not about like if they were to say look look i'm gonna wait till next year till the prices come down that could be considered more of a stall uh or maybe an objection depends how you think about it because it, an object a stall is more like i'll get back to you an objection is more like i don't i don't believe like i like a, like i don't think so like you know like if someone says like i'll sell in the, in the summer or i'll sell in the winter I guess that could be considered an objection because there's nothing wrong with you and I'm not getting back to you. It's not that I don't want to get back to you. It's just, I don't want to sell right now. So I guess that would be considered an objection. So yeah, I hear it a lot too, Tammy, about like, hey, I don't want to sell because what am I going to buy? Like, I'm going to buy something equally as expensive. So that's very true, right? So you want to role play that? We'll, we can role play that real quick. So if, um, if you were to say to me, you know, I don't want to sell right now because what am I going to go buy something expensive? Okay. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, uh, you're 100% right. The market right now is very competitive. But did you ever think about what would happen when the market takes a downturn? Are you guys familiar with what a buyer's market is? No. Okay. A buyer's market is basically when there's more supply than there is demand. That means there's over six months supply of houses and there's a, and there's a, a, a limited amount of buyers. There's not that many buyers in the market. Now, we may see that if we get rising, uh, rising interest rates, we may see that house prices could drop and sellers are, are now clamoring to sell their home before it, you know, we, we start hitting you know, lower and lower lows. And then the buyers are then at that point going to be kind of taken out of the market because they're not going to be able to qualify for as much house. So what I think that you should really weigh out is the possibility that if you wait any longer, and the market changes on us that you're not going to get as much money as you are going to get right now. So for instance, let's think about that. You're able to sell your house right now for $500,000. Did you know that last year, this time your house was only worth $400,000. So that means that's an extra $100,000 that you could walk away with now in your pocket than what you would have gotten last year. So let's just play devil's advocate for a second and say that we go back to that kind of a market and home prices drop to $400,000, maybe next year, maybe two years from now, whatever the case may be. That means that yes, you, you're gonna be able to get a better deal on a house. You may go ahead out, you may go out there and buy yourself a, a house for, for less money, but you're also gonna receive $100,000 less for your house. So at the end of the day, it's really all relevant. What I suggest that you do is you allow me to take you out to see what's on the market now, to see if there's anything worth even making offers on. And if there isn't, then you don't buy. You wait till you know, the market changes. Because at the end of the day, what you have to remember is that the only reason why you should move is if you find a better opportunity. The price is irrelevant because if you sell now, yes, you will pay more, but you're going to get more. And if you wait for a buyer's market, you're going to get a better deal, but you're going to also get less money for your house. So why don't we just go and see what's out there on the market before you make a decision on something that you really haven't thought 100% through yet. 
Yeah, that makes sense. But um, okay, so if I was to buy now and I found something that I really love, and you saying the house prices may drop now, and I'm living in this home and it's overpaid, and my house price dropped. So your question is, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding what your where your concern is. My concern is now that I'm now that I'm underwater and um, because the houses are not worth what it paid because the house market dropped. Okay, well you're you'd be underwater right now as well. So for instance, if you kept your house, you know you can get five hundred thousand for your house right now, correct? How much do you currently owe? Um, about two hundred. Okay, so that means that you'd be taking 300,000 and putting it into your next home. Now your next home might be a house that's 750. If you're buying a house for 750 and you're putting down 300, that means that you're only gonna be mortgaging about 450, which mm -hmm. means that the housing market goes down by 100,000 instead of that house being worth 750, it may only be worth 650. But mm -hmm. let me explain something to you. The better a housing market you go, the better location and neighborhood you go, the less affected the housing markets get. And I'll tell you why. Because white collar and professionals, they tend to lose their jobs very uh, much less. And people who own businesses and people who have um, you know very high earning incomes, they tend to do better during recessionary periods. As opposed to the entry level market where you are, people tend to lose their jobs more and become more constricted when we have a downturn. So if you look back at history, urban areas and first time home buyer uh, towns and locations have always gotten affected more by housing markets when they go down than they do in, in, in areas that are much more affluent because you are moving to a better area, isn't that correct? Yes. Yeah. So listen, I think, I think your investment would be better protected in that kind of environment than it would in a first time home buyer area. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make a lot of sense. I never looked at it that way. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, so there's a, there's a lot of things you can say about that, Tammy, but at the end of the day, really, it just depends on the person's motivation. If they're willing to go look at houses with you, then they're motivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're not, then they're not motivated. They're just not ready. Yeah. You know what, guys? <laughs> Phenomenal that I found in, in life and in investing is that people are more willing to sell at a loss than they are in profit. Does that make sense to you guys? The reason why is because when they're in profit, they feel like it's always going to be in profit and it's only going to go up. And if they sell now, they'd be losing because if they waited longer, they'd be in more profit. But as soon as the prices go down and they see their, their value evaporating, people want to sell out of fear. Fear is a bigger motivator than profit. Crazy, right? So just keep that in mind because a lot of selling is also psychological. Definitely. Thank you. No problem. And uh, I covered a little bit about commission with you guys. So that's price. And I'll talk to you guys a little bit about, you know, the person that wanted to pay 5%, they want to pay only 4%. Um, now about, you know, we got a few minutes left, but now let's just say that I want 500,000 for my house, but you know that the house is only worth 400, right? You know that. And I'm sure the sellers out there right now probably are very crazy right now. Everything that's going on in the market. How would you guys handle somebody who wants more more for their house right now in this market? How, how would you guys deal with that? Well, actually, that brings me to a good con concern. And let me ask if you think this is true. I'm being told by uh, people that based on the higher, like because the price is raised, for example, let's say 19% rather than the normal 5% of whatever it would per year, mm -hmm. that now appraisers are actually giving an extra 5% on their uh, appraisals. So where it concerns me is I gave a listing recently and I, and I gave her what I saw on RPR, but she didn't like it. And now I'm finding out that maybe I was off. So in handling this objection, first I would, I wanna ask you, can I actually use that as a tool? Well, actually, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Seller right now, because the way the market is, appraisers are actually valuing 5% uh, higher. So, or something like that. Can I use that? You can, um, you can, but um, my, I, what I've found is um, the more blunt and honest you are with them and the more real you are with them, the better, because if they're not going to listen to rationale, you're probably better off not taking the listing. You, whatever you want to use as your, as your, um, I guess your, your, your examples to kind of get them back down to earth is fine. You can use that. Uh, what, what I think would be really important to do is like, look, 
I know, Mr. Seller, you want 500,000 and the properties, in my opinion, only worth about 400,000. The market is a little bit crazy right now. And I'm not saying that it's impossible for you to get the 500,000. I'm not saying that somebody's not crazy enough to pay you the difference or buy it in cash. Anything is possible right now in this market. But let me ask you this. If your home, if we list your home and it's sitting on the market for three months and we have no offers, are you willing to bring the price down? What would, what would you say? I mean, if I had to. If you had to, okay, I understand. Now, do you think that after the home sitting for three months on the market and we drop it to, I don't know, 450, do you think that someone's gonna call us and say, hey, we're gonna give you full price for the, at 450, or do you think that people are going to call and say, hey, what's wrong with your property? How come it hasn't sold? I feel like it could be either or, but maybe you know more than me. <laughs> yeah. What I want to do is I'm trying to do right now, Mr. Sellers, I'm trying to set expectations because in my opinion, I would rather you shoot at a really realistic price and let people fight over your home at 400000 and maybe it'll get bid up to 450, 500. But what I feel that you may do by putting in that 500,000 is I think you may exclude a lot of people who are in the market right now and you may end up actually hurting yourself in the long run. But at the end of the day, this is your home. It's your asset. The only thing I can do is educate you on what I would do if I was in your position. But if you want me to take your listing, the only way I would do so is if you'd be willing, A, number one, to not blame me if the home does not sell and give it to another agent and relist it for 450 or 400 down the road if you could promise me that you won't do that and you'll listen to my advice as we go along, then I'll work with you. But you got to remember is that 500,000 may end up hurting you in the long run. It may end up getting less money than you would if you follow my advice. Well, what's, what would your advice be? My advice would be to go to 400,000 and let people fight over it. I think that what you, what you would do in that case is, is very much the way that it's been done for hundreds of years. Have you ever heard of an auction before? Uh, yes, yes, of course. At an auction, do people start high and, and go low? No, no, not at all. They start from the lowest point. Why do you think they do that? To get people to start bidding. Yes, just to get people excited. And what happens after that is the human psychology takes over and nobody wants to be the loser. So sometimes people end up paying way more money at auctions than they do in a normal price setting. Did you know that? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So we're not literally putting your home as an auction and we don't have a reserve that we need to meet. But what we want to do is use the same principles that have already been proven for hundreds of years. Uh, as you can see, the most expensive things in the world are sold through auctions. You know, the most expensive paintings, cars, you know, the assets that people uh, covet over are sold through auctions. So why would you, why would you want to do yours the opposite way? Well, I never thought of it like that. Yeah. So those are just some things you guys can use. You know, it's just some psychological, you know, I do a lot of question asking because you want to get in someone's head. You don't just want to tell, tell, tell. You want to ask because their opinion matters more than yours. You know, tell me all about what you think about. I don't care. I'd rather tell you what I think. So if you could do more question asking and let them come to their realization, you're in a better, you're in a better position, you're a better spot. Yeah, no, actually earlier when you did that to me on the first call, you said something and it made me want to say like, oh, from New York. And if you're a regular buyer, you might have fed into it. But I kind of resisted because my ego like didn't let me like admit that you were right. But a normal person would have probably went with it and they are selling themselves. So it is asking those questions to put them in a position where they're answering themselves. And it's actually what you want yeah, cool. them to 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 think or to know. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, Tammy. You guys have been awesome today. Does anyone have anything they want to add to today's call? Uh, just you send recordings of all of them or can I ask for this one? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I'll send it out to you guys. I also put them on our YouTube channel. Um, I'll give you guys I, I have something I want to add. Sure, go for when it. When I had went last uh, um, week to the appointment, yeah, I kind of got stuck because they caught me off guard and asked me what I charge. Yes. And I normally do 6%, but I shot myself in the foot because I said, well, I can do 5%, you know, if I work on your buy side, because they're going to be purchasing a home too. Okay. So, I, you know, like, and then my husband was like, you should have just told them 6% and tell them and told them why mm -hmm. it's 6%. But uh, what, what do you think about that, Louis? 
Um, I think that um, asking a question is always the answer. So for instance, when he asked you, um, how much is your commission? Was that the question? Yeah, he was like, how much your commission? I was like, 5%. And I was like, oh, wow, like that, like that's cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I got cool. I usually do six and I stay with confidence, but I don't know why I said five. Okay. So what I think you should do next time is state your answer and then question their question. You understand? So for instance, you, um, you're the seller and you say, how much is your commission? Okay. Well, my commission is 6%. Is commission very important to you or is selling your home uh, for the top amount of money, the most important thing to you? You understand? I'm not even giving them enough time to process what I just said without having them think about something else. So what I do is I answered their question and I took their mind off of their question and I redirected it to something else immediately. So my commission is 6%. But let me ask you a question. Is my commission the most important thing for your sale? or is getting the most amount of money the most important thing you guys are, are concerned about? So what would you say, Tim, if you're- getting the, most, getting the most money is important. Okay, getting the most amount of money for my house is the most important thing is what you would say, but we also wanna make sure we're not overpaying an agent, right? That's more mm -hmm. like, maybe. you know what? That is a valid concern and I definitely understand that. But do you really know why some real estate agents cut their commission? Now, you know, what I'm doing there is I'm planting some seeds of doubt. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you plant the seeds of doubt. And as you can convince that person that 6% is basically in their interest, in their best interest, then you got them. But you won't be able to do this in person if you don't practice in private. So pick somebody okay. to call today and, just, and guys practice this commission thing. This commission thing is okay. so important. Yeah, it is. Anyone else? Uh Think you guys are I think you guys are good right? All right let me i'm going to share the channel with you guys i think you guys should have it but i'm going to put it in the um yeah i, I do i do send it out i don't know if i send it out every week but I'm, whenever i do remember i send it out to you guys but i do post the trainings on um, a youtube real estate training channel okay cool all right let's go ahead and close out with our prayer guys uh, father god we thank you father as always, Father, we thank you for our help. We thank you for our families. We thank you for allowing us to be here today, Father, and learn. And I, I thank you personally, Father, for speaking through me and, and giving these agents what they need, giving them the ability to go out there and be more confident, Father, when they talk to their clients and to be more productive and be more successful, Father, to help their families and to provide for their families, Father. Father, I only ask you to provide us with intelligence, Father, with patience and with love, Father, so we can be better versions of ourselves every single day and go out there and really make a difference in this world. Father, we thank you for our blessings and we also thank you for all the trials and tribulations that we go through. We only ask you, Father, to always walk with us in, in your light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Amen. Have an amazing week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.